Welcome to AgriPulse Newsmakers, where we aim to take you to the heart of ag policy. I'm Spencer Chase. Our guest this week is Senator Michael Bennett, who joins us to discuss farm labor legislation and his farm bill priorities. But first, here's this week's headlines. The latest consumer price index shows grocery store prices increased by half a percent in November, despite declines in the cost of beef, pork, and poultry. Prices for bread, fruits, vegetables, and eggs all increased. Supermarket prices are up 12% in the past year, and the overall CPI is up more than 7%. President Joe Biden said the newest CPI shows prices are still too high, and there's still work to do. The Department of Agriculture rolled out $325 million worth of funding for a new round of Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities projects. The new funding round will include a greater role for minority farmers and institutions. The projects are designed to measure and verify the impact of climate-related farm practices and to test ways to market commodities that are produced with a smaller environmental footprint. The first round of awards announced earlier this year went to 70 other projects that will share up to $2.8 billion. And finally, months of negotiations in the Senate led to legislation this week that would offer a path to legalization for farm workers. The bill is a companion measure to the House-passed Farm Workforce Modernization Act, which has passed in each of the last two sessions of Congress. But the Senate Affordable and Secure Food Act contains a handful of other changes and has a limited amount of time for floor consideration. Colorado's Michael Bennett introduced the bill after serving as the lead Democrat in negotiations with Senator Mike Crapo of Idaho. When we spoke to him, we asked him why one side of Capitol Hill could advance a measure but the other has been unable to do so. It's staggering. I think that, the, and I say it's staggering because the House tends to be more partisan than the, than the Senate. But when it comes to dealing with the labor crisis that we have in agriculture, they've been able to b pass a bipartisan bill twice to do it. And I, to be honest with you, I think that it's because there are farmers in the House of Representatives who understand what this crisis actually looks like. They happen to be, you know, in, in some cases, Republicans, and they've led the effort. And, and I think the Senate, maybe people are just too far away from the producers in their states to understand what a crisis this is and the importance of doing this now, because we're not going to do it when we've got a divided Congress. You know, we have the benefit of the House work, as you pointed out, their bipartisan bill that passed twice. We've now, we've now got a bill on our side of the on our side of the chamber or the capital that would save producers another $2 billion over the $21 billion that the House bill would save. And, you know, I need some Republican colleagues uh, to help step up and get this done. Well, uh, we, as you well know, we are now measuring the, the time remaining in the current session of Congress in days and uh, rather than weeks. That information in mind, what do you envision as the path forward for the legislation that you this is going to take? This is going to take a Christmas miracle to get this done. There's no question about it. But there is a broad coalition of producers and the farm workers that are working Capitol Hill right now as we speak. I just met with the CEO of one of the largest co-ops in America today, and I know that she's been meeting uh, with other other Senate uh, leaders on this issue on the Ag Committee. So we're just going to have to see if there's some people that are willing to go to Mitch McConnell and ask him to to put this as part of the omnibus, which is how we're going to have to get it passed. What would you say are the biggest changes in your legislation compared to what has passed the House? I would say the biggest changes are the economic changes. I think that, you know, the the changes to wage rates that create that extra savings for producers of a couple billion dollars. Those are really the biggest changes. There's an increase in the H-2A visas, and there's the creation of year-round visas um, and a reservation of half of those visas for our dairy industry, which, as you know, is an in in incredible crisis in our country because we haven't been able to find labor. Those are the biggest changes in the bill. 
You mentioned uh, that you're also going to need some Republican support. You've been working on this issue for a while, and, and obviously legislation just introduced this week. But based on conversations you've had with Republican colleagues up until this point, what do you think are the prospects for GOP support of your bill? I mean, I think that the I think that the people there are Republican senators who are aware of this crisis, and there are Republican senators who, if this uh, bill came to the floor one way or another would vote for this bill. And I think there are probably more than 10, which is what we need to pass this. Um, what's been harder is to get people to sort of organize, to, to, to lead on it. And I think in part, the reason is that, you know, people are, um, they, they often say that, you know, until the, until the border security issues are dealt with, um, that we can't do anything. And I think that, you know, having been part of the Gang of Eight who wrote the 2013 Comprehensive Immigration Bill for Democrats and for Republicans together, where we spent $40 billion in that bill on border security, I'm no stranger to those border issues, and I think they're incredibly important. But what we're talking about right now is the end of the family farm in America. That that really is the possible the possible outcome of our failure to deal with this and rationalizing the immigration system, at least with respect to our to the to the farm workers and to the people that employ the farm workers. I think we should go ahead and do that. We're never gonna, you know, in the in the foreseeable future, we're never gonna solve the other issues that comprehensive immigration reform should solve. We'll be right back to talk farm bill priorities and the Western drought with Senator Michael Bennett right after this. It's not as simple just to wake up one day and go, I want to be a conservation farmer. You're changing how your, your farming practice is done. You're changing your operation. Farm Credit supported John and Kelly Watley as they shifted to more sustainable farming, improving the environment where they farm and live. Learn more at farmcredit.com climate. At Bayer, we know possibility grows from the seed of a vision. That you can start small and still reach big dreams. That we can nurture the future in our schools to create innovations down the road. That rural communities aren't just farms, but all the people they feed. That's why Bayer partners with farmers to protect those ideas. Because together, we're tending tomorrow's harvest. Welcome back. Senator Michael Bennett has been conducting Farm Bill listening sessions throughout the state of Colorado in preparation for the upcoming Farm Bill reauthorization. He says those sessions have been helpful as he and his staff try to fine tune their priorities. Every time we do a Farm Bill, I, I, I go out and do these listening sessions. We've done 16 this time and we're still going. We're still going. Uh, labor is a huge issue that I, I hear about, what we just talked about that. Drought is just a massive issue in Colorado and across the Rocky Mountain West. And the increase in inputs, just the cost of producing everything has gotten so expensive. So those are all things that I think people are going to be looking at uh, during this farm bill. And I think it's for important for us to understand, you know, the really difficult headwinds that are blowing against American agriculture as we go into this farm bill negotiation and, th and try to figure out how to be as imaginative as possible to respond to the real needs that farmers and ranchers have. Well, you talk about the, the drought concerns that a lot of folks have. A lot of folks in the, the western part of the country, a uh, number of states seem to be kind of at loggerheads over how to handle the issue of managing the Colorado River and the water that it supplies uh, throughout the, the western United States. But for agriculture, is are, are we at a point where farmers might have to curtail production as a result of some of these water management issues? I, I think it's very important that, ag that, that, that a target not be put on the back of agriculture. You know, we've got to, we have to solve this issue as a region together, the upper basin and the lower basin of the Colorado River have to come together. We've got to forge a consensus about what the next century is going to look like in the American West. The future of the American West depends on our ability of, you know, doing that. I think that the, the farm bill is going to be an interesting place to have those kind of conversations. But, you know, in the end, it's going to be a lot better if this is a consensus that's arrived at by the states, not an outcome that's dictated by the federal government. And I think the federal government can be there with resources 
to help fund the commitment that these states make. Um, and there have been other chapters in American history when we've done that, like with the uh, the with the pollution in the Great Lakes. We face obviously a very different issue in the in the Colorado River Basin, but this drought affects 40 million Americans, and we are in a 1,200 year a drought that's lasted for the last 22 years. Um, Washington's going to have to play an important supporting role here. You and Senator Romney led a letter with uh, 14 other senators uh, outlining the conservation needs of the West. For folks that might not be as familiar with the conservation needs of your unique part of the country, how big is the need here? Uh, the need is massive. I mean, there's not a, there, there, look, every farmer and rancher in Utah and every farmer and rancher in Colorado, this is why we knows that, you know, we are, we are essentially in a perpetual drought now, and we're going to have to, um, we're going to have to face that, and we're going to need the federal government's help and and financial support to be able to do it well. And and farmers are going to have to learn from each other what the best practices are to be able to hold on to their to their farms and ranches in this in this in this in this drought that's not going away. And I think it is important for people in Washington to understand this because of the number of people that live downstream from 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 Colorado, frankly, and and because it, it's such an important agricultural region for the United States of America. And I think, you know, in the Inflation Reduction Act at the end of the year, we were able to get four billion dollars to to get focused on Western drought. That's an important step forward. But there's going to be a lot more that we're going to need to do. How, how much more do you think you mentioned the four billion dollars in IRA funding? How much more do you think uh, of a need is there? I don't know. I mean, I but I I think that what we face is an existential issue, and and hopefully people of goodwill are going to be able to come together and support this important region in the United States of America. You know, last year was the first time that smoke from Western fires, in this case it was from California, reached the East Coast, reached Washington D.C. We have been having the worst fires in our state's histories. Uh, respectively, uh, as a result of uh, climate change and as a result of the drought. The fact that that smoke finally arrived in the nation's capital, I think, caught people's attention. And what I hope to help lead is uh, a national commitment to the Western United States that is something that every citizen in this country ought to care about. Senator, I want to wrap up with this uh, with one last quick question for you here. Uh, as you look at sort of the big four leadership of the House and Senate Agriculture Committees, the furthest West member uh, resides in Arkansas. And, and I say that not to disrespect the the, the folks uh, that are, will be in those leadership positions. But I do ask you, as, as a Western member of that committee, what do you and your fellow Westerners need to do to make the, the needs of Western agriculture known headed into this upcoming fall? We need to make sure that people know that the water issues in the West are completely different than the water issues in the East, and that that has huge, profound implications for uh, for agriculture. You know, we've got big, big water quantity issues in the West. Arkansas obviously doesn't. They've got water quality issues. My wife is from, happens to be from a a uh, farming community in eastern Arkansas, in the in the middle of the in the middle of the Mississippi Delta. So I know that region well, and 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 we're just very different. And and unfortunately, there are Western members on the Ag Committee, and I look forward to working with both Democrats and Republicans to make sure we lift the voices of the American West in this Farm Bill, and that the Farm Bill is responsive, not just to. Uh, Eastern and Midwestern interests, but to the West as well. And I think we can do that. Senator, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. We'll be right back to hear from this week's panel. But first, our Hannah Pegel takes a look at specialty crop coverage in this week's Map It Out. Many farmers across the country grow specialty crops like fruits, vegetables, tree nuts, and nursery crops. USDA offers crop insurance that protects producers against crop losses by natural causes through the Federal Crop Insurance Program. One of those policies is Whole Farm Revenue Protection, which provides coverage against the loss of revenue for all commodities on a farm under one insurance policy. This map shows the number of specialty crop insurance policies sold in each state across the U.S. California has the most specialty crop policies with nearly 23,000. 
The top four policies are for almonds, grapes, oranges, and walnuts. North Dakota has the second most, less than 200 behind California. The top two policies are for dry peas and dry beans. Alaska has the fewest plans, three for dry peas. A report from the American Farm Bureau Federation says specialty crop growers face many unique challenges, like selling to a small number of buyers and sellers. That makes it harder to establish prices reflecting supply and demand. Look for the upcoming Farm Bill to include a good deal of discussion on these policies and what improvements could be made for specialty crop producers. For AgriPulse, I'm Hannah Pagel. Farmers are always there for each other. We shed tears together, we celebrate together, but we also grow together. Farm Bureau is the largest general farm organization in the country. We have the farmers back. If you're a farmer and you're not a member, we would welcome you into our Farm Bureau family. And if you want to know more about agriculture, come be part of this great family. Welcome back to AgriPulse Newsmakers, where I am excited to have a conversation on the ag laborer situation and the legislation introduced this week with a panel of experts who know a heck of a lot about this topic. Joined this week by Mary Nowak with the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives, Michael Marsh with the National Council of Agricultural Employers, and Claudia Larson with the National Milk Producers Federation. Appreciate all of you taking the time here. And, and Michael, I want to go to you first, because we've seen a number of folks uh, involved in discussions on some kind of farm labor compromise for, for quite a while now, as we've worked for a Senate companion to a the House passed Farm Workforce Modernization Act. We saw legislation introduced this week from one of those folks, but in your estimation, why did the talks between Senators Bennett and Crapo uh, not lead to a compromise deal? Well, Spencer, uh, thanks for the question. I think that it, it's like anything else. It's legislation, and no legislation is ever going to be perfect. Uh, I think that the, the two senators worked as diligently as they could to try to find compromise with one another on different aspects of, of, of the piece of legislation that they were developing. And at the end of the day, unfortunately, that didn't uh, really pan out that they were able to get to that compromise position. Mm -hmm. We're very excited, of course, though, to have at least an introduction of a bill so we can have something to look at and see and analyze it to determine how it's going to impact agricultural employers in the United States. And importantly, with this piece of legislation, it takes care of one of those pr very pressing issues we've had in agriculture, and that's figuring out some type of legal status uh, for those individuals who are here but are in unauthorized uh, status. Well, and, and Mary, as we look at the folks that have uh, opted to support this piece of legislation, uh, about a dozen agricultural organizations throwing their weight behind it at this point. But we recently saw a letter from about 350 agricultural organizations uh, asking uh, the Senate to move a compromise piece of legislation. You gotta grade that number with a bit of a curve because some of them are several state organizations of the same commodity group, but a much, much, much smaller number. Why, why do you think that is? Well, I think first and foremost that there hasn't been another letter that has been circulated to the broader agriculture community and giving them the opportunity to endorse it. It also, you know, Senator Bennett unveiled the bill today. Um, so there just hasn't been as much time, I think, for agricultural stakeholders to thoroughly review the bill, to talk internally within their own organizations, um, and to figure out what their position is going to be on the bill going forward. So, Senator, I do fully anticipate that there will be a lot more than 12 agricultural organizations and agribusinesses that do throw their weight and support behind the Senator Bennett's efforts. So if we can get bigger than 12, can we get all the way up to the 350 that, that were on the letter? Or do you think some folks are not going to be able to, once they review the legislation, not be able to offer their organization support? Yeah, I think that I have heard of a couple of folks um, deciding to be neutral on the bill. Um, I haven't heard of any group so far straight out opposing Senator Bennett's bill or that legislation, the ag groups that we work with at least. Um, so I do think that there will be more groups that get onto that letter. I sure hope that we have, you know, 300, 300 plus um, groups that are able to get on it. Um, but as soon as we do have that letter, we will make sure that you guys are the first ones to get it. Well, we will certainly appreciate that as obviously a number of folks keeping a very, very close eye on this situation, including the dairy industry seeking uh, the year round relief that uh, could have come from this uh, legislation uh, for under that H-2A program. And, and Claudia, that's where I'll bring you in here, because just uh, to kind of frame up the, the conversation for us, what do you think the expansion of that H-2A program would mean for the nation's dairy producers? 
Sure, thank you for this question. One thing about dairy I want everyone to always remember is we are a little bit different than a lot of the other um, sectors and agricultural commodities insofar as correct, we don't have access to the H-2A program right now. We need protection for our current workers and we need real and meaningful access to the H-2A program for us to continue to survive. So yes, this bill does expand access to the H-2A program a little bit more than what's in the House bill. Um, but one of the primary reasons why we're supporting this bill is actually about the protection of our current workers, knowing just how important that is to our farmers and our farm workers across the nation. When you mentioned protection of your current workforce, can you, can you elaborate uh, for folks that might not be as familiar with the legislation what exactly that means? Sure. So um, Mr. Bennett's version builds on the version of um, this, these provisions in, in the House bill. Um, and by protection of current workers, what we mean is there are provisions in here for those who are currently working in agriculture to be able to come out of the shadows, to say we're working in agriculture. Here's you know demonstrated proof that we're working in agriculture. And then they're granted a status called the certified agricultural worker status. That status um, gives them legal protection it, it makes them, it gives them the opportunity to get right with the law, and then they're able to stay here and continue to work in agriculture under that certified agricultural worker status. Now, both the House bill and the Senate bill also have an additional level to that, and that is after you've worked in agriculture, um, continue to work in agriculture, earning this legal status, you then are also um, given the opportunity to apply for legal permanent residency. We'll be right back with more from our panel right after this. Looking closer, seeing further. That's how we do it. At Curious Plot, we're driven to find what's next for agriculture, animal care, and food. We stay curious because that's what it takes to grow understanding. That's how we plot strategies and tell stories that get results time after time. Marketing, communications, and consulting that look closer and see further. Curious Plot. We can't wait to help you tell your story. Welcome back. The nation's farm workers could stand to benefit from changes being discussed to the nation's farm workforce laws in Congress, but Mary Nowak with the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives says producers could as well. You know, I think one of the first issues um, at a lot of producers' minds when it comes to this bill really has to do with wages. Um, the House bill limited the amount of which the adverse effect wage rate, which is the required wage rate under the H-2A program, um, how it limits how much that can grow from year to year. Um, and similar construct under this Senate bill, and it further narrows how much the A work can increase. And so for a lot of producers around the country, this gets right down to their pocketbooks. It gets right down to what their input costs are going to be next year. Um, we were notified that tomorrow we are likely going to see what the 2023 AWERS are going to be uh, across the country. And a lot of states are seeing double digit increases um, in their labor costs, which as many folks know is, is kind of the, the largest input cost that they have. Um, so I think the, the opportunities that this bill provides provides itself to producers um, is, is real cost savings. There's the access issues that Claudia mentioned that it's not just for dairy. There's a lot in the specialty crop industry, um, you know, greenhouses, there's pork. I mean, there's so many industries that have year round needs that will now have access um, under this, this program because of this bill. So those well, are just to, to name a couple of sensors. Well, and of course, and, and, and I want to bring Michael in here because we talk about the fact that the uh, the time in the current Congress is running thin and, and we look ahead to the upcoming Congress with a Republican control of the House of Representatives. I do wonder, is, 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 is there a prospect for this kind of conversation to continue in a Republican controlled House or is, is the time for this issue really before the end of the current Congress? Yeah, Spencer, I, from our perspective, the time for this legislation was several years ago. Uh, unfortunately, we were unsuccessful at passing this uh, out in uh, out of the House, or even getting it heard in the House of Representatives uh, back in 2013. So it's it's high time that we do something on ag labor reform. The um, it, this will be very difficult to build to get uh, all the way to the finish line. I think probably Senator Bennett probably shared that with you as well. Uh, but at the same time, if if you don't step up to the plate, you're never going to get a hit. So we need to see if we can get a hit here. 
Well, and, and Claudia, I want to wrap up with you because, uh, you know, we look at the prospects for consideration and, and the timelines for it. Obviously, very, very tight margins for, for consideration before the end of the year here. But absent congressional action, in, in, your, in your opinion, the, the status quo that we already, uh, you know, know and love and probably uh, shouldn't use the term love there, but the status quo for the labor situation that we have, what would the continuation of that mean for the dairy industry? Sure. Um, I mean, speaking to what our dairy farmers are facing right now, um, I know across the country we have dairy farmers who are forced to make decisions operating in the reality where there's just not labor. So they're no longer deciding where to invest their money. They're no longer deciding how to grow their business, whether to pass their business on to future generations with uncertainty that there's no labor. No, it's different now. Now they know that there is no labor and that is a primary variable that they take into consideration when deciding whether to grow their business or close their business. And we've heard of a lot of dairy farmers who've decided to shut down their operations because they know that there's no labor and there's really no way for them to continue. So the continuation of the status quo is just not acceptable. I can speak mostly to the dairy industry, but Mary and Michael can chime in about how it uh, affects all of agriculture. But for the dairy industry, it, it will ultimately in the longer term um, lead to a lot of farms shutting down. And if we wanna save the American family farm, if we wanna save those small dairy farms, we need access to labor. Well, of course, access to labor going to be such a critical uh, issue for a number of, of producers heading into the new year, watching this issue very closely and watching for possible uh, movement of this piece of legislation. We'll keep a very close eye on that at agripulse.com, and I'm sure our panelists will be keeping a close eye of their own as well. But for now, I think that's going to do it. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll be right back with more AgriPulse newsmakers, but first, our Hannah Pegel tracks how much of your food dollar is going to farmers and ranchers in this week's Ag by the Numbers. The American farmer's share of each dollar spent on domestically produced food is shrinking. This chart shows the amount of money farmers were making per dollar in 2021. You can see farmers only received 14.5 cents of every dollar that consumers spent on food both at home and at restaurants. According to USDA, the remaining 85.5 cents go toward what it calls the marketing share, which covers processing, transportation, packaging, and other aspects of the supply chain. Data from the National Farmers Union shows what farmers are making on the dollar for individual products. You can see that farmers are making 48 cents on the dollar for both milk and carrots. Those numbers decreased to 22 cents for steak, 16 cents for bacon, and 4.8 cents for bread. One of the main factors causing the problem is that more people are going out to eat instead of staying at home like they did during the COVID-19 pandemic. Farmers receive a smaller share of spending when people go out to eat compared to when people buy food to eat at home. For AgriPulse, I'm Hannah Pegel. Did you know AgriPulse has all your favorite podcasts, including Open Mic, Newsmakers, and Drive Time. Take us wherever you go. Subscribe at agripulse.com or on Spotify, Google Play, or Apple Podcasts. Agriculture Future of America is a nonprofit building transformational leaders in food and agriculture. AFA prepares college students to join the workforce as innovative and engaged young professionals who will shape the future of agriculture. Head to agfuture.org to find out how you can get involved. Thanks again for tuning in for another episode of AgriPulse Newsmakers. Before we let you go, here's what's on the horizon for the upcoming week. As is often the case with the week before Christmas, it's shaping up to be a quiet week in farm policy, but year-end action could dominate the news. Congress is expected to stay in session through December 22nd to wrap up government funding and other lame duck priorities. We'll also be keeping a close eye on the Environmental Protection Agency for a possible rollout of Waters of the U.S. rulemaking. As always, we'll be monitoring whatever unfolds at agripulse.com. For AgriPulse Newsmakers, I'm Spencer Chase. Have a good one. Newsmakers is a production of AgriPulse Communications. For more ag policy news, visit agripulse.com. You can also find our new content on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow AgriPulse and our correspondents on social media to get breaking news and more.